Welcome to week seven, the week in which we're going to talk about audio sites and video sites across the internet. At this point, we've changed tack in the semester. We're now in the second shift, moving towards the culmination of the e-performance review, the end of your first phase of your projects, and the completion of the portfolio. The next series of videos, the marketing applications, will be case study driven. We're going to talk about the way in which the marketing mix interacts with a key area. In this case, it's going to be audio. And then we're going to talk about a couple of audio sites as case studies. The aim here is to provide you with a chart to do some co-creation. You want to look at the sites that we've presented and see if they fit into your project, if they could be beneficial alternative channels, or if they're the channel that you're using, it's a sort of support and reinforcement of the process you're taking. Also, as we work through these areas, we're looking at taking what we covered in the first half of semester, particularly around the marketing mix, and applying it directly. So we go from this is the mix as a conceptual with some examples to this is how the mix would function within audio, video, and the related category areas. So let's get into it. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to start each of the sections off with a quick overview of any relevant key software uh, that applies to the platform, applies to the concept framework. Now, one thing I will say with regards to the audio side of things is that I'm not really going to focus on voice activated technology. I don't use Siri or Alexa or Google at home. And as a result, I don't have a lot of expertise in this area to pass comment or create content. Suffice to say, as a marketer, I think they're in the early phases of their technological rollout. I think we're very early in the product lifecycle. So there's plenty of room for growth and there's a lot of opportunity if somebody wants to come through and do an equivalent of the slide deck around, say, voice activated technologies. But at this point, all I will say is Google, stop, collaborate, and listen, and let's see how it goes outside for anyone who's got a Google at home. So let's talk audio. On the outbound audio front, the focus here is on any site where the primary purpose is the distribution of audio. So we're talking here podcasts, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, any point where the priority is non-visual with audio accompaniment. With that in mind, audio is inherently bound into video, so it can get a little blurry at points, it can get a little crossed over. Uh, we're not looking for perfect categorizations, we're looking for primary focus. And also with regards to audio is there is a propensity for them to be streaming or download. Now, with regards to that, we'll pick that up in terms of product and the value offer and the distribution channels. However, for you as a marketer, the question that you want to have is, does my customer get greater value from streaming, aka web-based, or greater value from having possession of the MP3 or MP4 file? So it's a decision for you and that will determine some of your distribution outlets. In terms of software, I'd just like to give a shout out to Winamp. Now, when Five Point Infinity emerged back out of nowhere, it was wonderful because Winamp ceased trading, it shut down, it stopped being a thing. Uh, it was a sad day for us Winamp fans. It's also a hugely wonderful platform when it comes to co-creation. There was a lot of energy and love invested in creating skins for Winamp, visualizations, and other audio-visual plugins. 
So it's a reasonably vibrant and robust tool, uh, but it is an older technology. And it's here largely to go and say that audio players, standalone audio players, are relatively rare, but when they're used well and they're developed well, like WinApp, they can be amazing for co-creation. On the second tier, I'd like to mention the notion of broadcast. Now, one of the challenges from the early internet is that when we had sufficient bandwidth to be able to broadcast audio, there was a lot of interest in self-hosted, self-created radio stations. Unfortunately, the MPAA, the uh, major labels, and pretty much anyone who had a copyright stick to hit the internet with, decided that widespread broadcast of radio was bad because they had managed to convince radio stations that instead of charging the music studio's advertising space for playing their product on the air, they should pay royalty fees and license fees for advertising their products. Terrible, terrible framework. But functionally, the end result meant that if you wanted to be a DJ online, you wanted to broadcast content, you needed to go through a brokerage that handled the licensing fees. And Shoutcast is one of the better brokerage services that's around. So if you do have a desire to play your favorite track lists out into the ether and become a, a radio DJ, I recommend at least giving Shoutcast a look. If you want to be an actual two turntables and a mixed desk type DJ, SoundCloud is your friend. All right, a note here. I previously have endorsed Audacity, and up until the time of recording this video, Audacity was a good platform. If you can get your hands on versions of the software that predate version 3.3, and I'd say effectively predate version 3.2 as well, it's still a good piece of software. Unfortunately, Audacity was purchased recently by an organization that decided to promptly ruin it. What they did, what Muse has done, is they have introduced a number of data collection and tracking elements into a software package that doesn't need them, won't benefit from them, and is actively harming a number of communities of users by including them. The bottom line is this, there's no marketing justification or marketing research justification to collect the information that they're collecting when they say that they're expressly doing so for the purposes of handing data over to law enforcement agencies. There are a number of countries where religions, sexual orientation, and being of a particular caste, race, creed is illegal. So creating a podcast to support these, to support your lived experience in some of these areas is data, the identification of people doing that is data necessary for law enforcement. It is wrong to collect this information and Audacity has made, Muse has made a terrible decision in ruining Audacity by doing so. If you have a look at their full privacy statement, it's worse than the highlights package. I'm just highlighting the major thing here is don't use this platform if you are using the current. If you have a copy of it, don't update it. But do look for the Audacity Splinter. Because it's open source, it can be forked and it can be taken up by other projects and other users. So a privacy-enabled Audacity is it still a good asset. But this variant of it, Audacity, with its awful choice to put in identifiable data. And the other thing that I will point out here is that combining CPU being used, IP address being used, OS being used, this is the sort of tracker data that identifies documents back to the original creator. This is a dangerous tool that can be used for suppression of minority groups and it's a stupid non-marketing solution because it gains no value to the end user. It is actively harmful and detrimental to the user.
So the reason I'm showcasing it and I'm still mentioning it is as a marketer, you are going to face ethical challenges when people say, oh, I want to collect that data. If you are collecting data that can harm your end user, then you have a responsibility as a marketer under our ethics and our moral codes as marketers to turn around and say no and to stay in that fight until the data is not collected. It's not enough to resign and protest and walk away. You've got to fight tooth and nail and block at every step. And if they get it through, you fight to get it removed. It is dangerous data. It is not marketing data. And it is harmful to end users. Fight as marketers. Fight this sort of incursion. Because we are in the business of creating value. We are not in the business of causing harm. Now, with your reminder that we are an ethics-driven social enterprise and that we have a responsibility to the community because we have a responsibility to stakeholders, the next concept we come back around to is the idea of what's the value off of an audio product. If you are creating an audio product, one of the things to be aware of is metadata. Inside every MP3 is a range of data that you can encode yourself and you can use it to label files, you can use it to have URLs that point back to the source Bandcamp or the source SoundCloud it comes from. There's a lot of information you can wrap in to create benefit to the end user beyond just a file name that is band album track. In addition, what I'd like you to do in this, when we come across these product concepts, is this is about co-creation. It's about you going, what is the value offer I could provide through my project to my customer by using an audio product? Can I, is there a value to a podcast? Is there a value to an audio file? Is a voiceover walkthrough the use of my product useful? Is a, you know, if you are running an Instagram for gym training, is a voiceover instruction telling people, keeping time for them, telling them the pace of the reps, what can I create of value that is audio driven that my consumer would benefit from? All right, let's get, we've got product, now we're going to go price, and then we're going to go into distribution. When it comes to price, what we're thinking about is what does the end user pay in terms of access? And we're thinking here financial as our initial pass through price. So for something like the ABC to take its radio broadcast, slice that up and then redistribute it over its website as a series of podcasts and audio snippets, the content is free. You listen to it, there is no financial charge for listening. The second tier is the freemium. Now the freemium idea is that we can choose to pay in to the network that supports the audio we're listening to. For example, if you're running a podcast and you have advertisers, your listeners can choose to buy from those advertisers in order to support you indirectly. And this is where you'd use something like a discount code or a, pre a premium code so that the advertiser knew the person buying was coming from your broadcast and therefore the advertising was of value to you as podcast producer and to them as advertiser. So the freemium allows us to elect in, to buy in to the process. The premium is where you pay money in order to access the audio value offer. And I'm treating this as two separate components. I'm treating this as the one-off purchase, the non-subscription purchase. So you go to Bandcamp and you buy an MP4, you buy your MP3, you buy your track from the artist through Bandcamp as the brokerage. You get the file and then it's your supply. Your companion variant on this, so that's more transactional. This is, uh, to some extent, more relational. It's more of an ongoing concern. 
But the notion here is that you pay subscription to access the streams, you pay subscription to access the content on demand, but you don't retain any of the data. So you don't have the files downloaded necessarily. It's predominantly an access and to create value through the access is a certain sense of denying the you don't want the file to be retained by the customer because if they're retaining it then they can it, it can be displayed therefore it can be copied on the non-financial considerations around price non-financial price and audio what you want to be thinking here and what you want to be doing here is thinking about where you could fit audio into your value propositions for your project and as a consequence what would that non-financial price of those audio elements those audio assets within your project what would they be for your customer for example I don't use a podcast inside the e-marketing subject because I use a video cast each of these episodes could have their audio stripped out and released as a standalone podcast. However, when I did that, I created an increased risk and increased time price. In the subject where I ran video plus an audio variant of the video, which was literally just this audio track of the video ripped and distributed as an MP3, a number of students complained at the time that the audio file was very repetitive because they were listen they were watching the video and listening to the audio because they assumed there would be something different in the audio and wouldn't trust that there was they were the same pieces of content. So the fear of missing out, the FOMO risk that became such that they were doubling up and it was an inefficient distribution of content and ideas. Also for all of you who have been convinced that the YouTube and the stream and the Echo 360 are different. Hi, that's a shout out to you because no they're not. I One file, three different distribution platforms because it's enough to create one file. All right, I'm, I'm not that enthused and enthusiastic. Other things in terms of non-financial considerations around audio files, they're quite often done in, audio is consumed in real time, uh, unless you're really into chipmunks and Alvin and the chipmunk sounds, you tend not to accelerate your MP3 collection. Effort is quite often low because you can have audio playing in the background, you can have audio as just an amb ambient soundtrack, and it's common to do parallel consumption, audio plus another task. Uh, the very existence of lo-fi beats for studying as a 24-7 YouTube channel puts emphasis on the fact that audio can be an enhancer of other efforts. And finally, in terms of sort of the energy and lifestyle, the music can and audio can just fit in. Audio is quite often played in surgery. Don't. You go to a dentist, you go to a doctor's, there's a radio station playing. Music is made, and music, so I'm trying not to emphasize music and audio is the same thing. Music is often used to normalize the situation. Audio can be used as a means and mechanisms for when you have your attention in one area, but you want the input. So you can be listening to a podcast whilst you're training, you can be listening to a podcast whilst you're out walking, you number of people use podcasts whilst they're driving or on public transport to make use of that time. So parallel consumption is a facet, but parallel consumption also creates huge market opportunity and huge value opportunity. And look, I'm going to put this out there is I would like someone to try making a podcast that's designed to be timed with the light rail in Canberra. I think it's reasonably accurate that the, I think the times and the gaps between the stops are roughly the same, but I'd love someone to go out there and do a podcast that 
each segment was between from station to station. It's out there for you. I've thought about doing it a number of times, but I just want to put it out there as an option. So parallel consumption. Create the template, the timing template of the journey, and then use it for some way of having people explore the journey, perhaps. Yeah, the guide to Canberra, the tourist guide to Canberra. Get on the tram, head outbound, play episode two, head inbound. Think about it as an option. All right, let's talk distribution. I want to mention a couple of things uh, here. Digital and tangible is audio streaming. So your Spotify's and your Shoutcasts, where you don't anticipate downloading a file in order to access. So digital radio, uh, streaming, that's basically the key there. Where the file needs to reside on the device in order to play, so that's downloading your music to your iPhone or your Android, that's downloading your MP3 to your hard drive so you can play it in Winamp, that's the digital tangible. A lot of podcasts are distributed over digital tangible and a lot of albums are done over digital tangible. Now I've taken out convertible and tangible. It did exist as a going concern and that's where we would burn mixed CDs or you make a mixed DVD. If you had a lot of time you might wanted four hours of music. Otherwise 45-ish minutes of music a blank CD that you burnt off your CD burner and you wrote on with the texter. That was a common practice. It's now way less common. Uh, even though the device that I record this lecture series on does have a DVD player and does have a DVD burner capacity and could burn CDs, I haven't bought a blank CD in a very long time and I have nothing other than the device I created it on to play it. So I don't see a point in It's there, but I don't promote it as a going concern. That said, the transportable tangible, vinyl is still a thing. Uh, and this is the idea that you order online music that you've been listening to on MP3 or on YouTube or on Spotify, and then you get an atomized version of it shipped out to you in physical copy. And the final one here is the mediated and tangible. Now, I mention this because, as you'll know, at the start of this video, there's the little audio stinger that introduces and goes underneath our video graphic. That audio is licensed from Envato, and I pay a monthly subscription fee to the Envato network, so I have ongoing license to use that and several of the stock footage video pieces that make up those opening vignettes. It is service brokerage. All right, let's talk case studies and there's a couple of things to, a couple of sites to talk about. First of all, SoundCloud. The old uh, Twitter joke about, you know, you get popular, then you just link your next tweet down from your popular tweet is linking to your SoundCloud. The idea behind SoundCloud is that it's a distribution platform for artists. Uh, can, I think it works better for longer play these days. Uh, it used to be very much about the undiscovered musician and you'd put up your singles and your sort of EPs and albums. These days, the way SoundCloud has slowly started to pivot, you pay as the artist, you pay a premium to access bigger volumes of content, delivery, larger hosting space, and better options. If I was to run this subject as an audio only, and I was to do a series of podcasts for the subject, I would probably distribute them through SoundCloud because I could then pay for the premium access and embed that content. I also tend to, now, my own use case for SoundCloud is I have a number of my tracks from my time as a producer in the early 2000s, I uh, have those hosted up on SoundCloud. One thing it's currently not doing as well as it used to is uh, the discovery mode. The hashtagging and content discovery is not as good as it used to be. I don't know why SoundCloud pivoted in that respect, but they have moved, they're slowly moving away from it being 
a broad discovery tool set to a more search oriented I've come to a specific artist I'm here for their page the second area is Bandcamp and Bandcamp's a particularly good retail outlet it's basically the Etsy it's the Etsy of audio you can also run a series of payment fulfillments you can sell tickets you can sell merchandise you can sell additional materials in support of your audio product what I really like about it is that it actually has a far superior audience discovery and audience random encounter mechanism this is something that SoundCloud used to do particularly well it was very easy to find new content related to keywords or key ideas or genres now Bandcamp has a better streaming finding capacity you can still search both but Bandcamp is the better for discovery it's also good if you are an independent or a standalone that you can have a lot greater control of your and management of your own distribution of audio sale of audio and pricing now next tier up in terms of the this is a distribution outlet and this is a wholesaler so if you think about Bandcamp as a retailer and SoundCloud really is a retailer and we're calling back to our distribution model of the arrows and boxes anchor FM's role is to distribute podcasts it can be used to create podcasts but functionally your best use of it is once you've got your podcast ready you've got your dozen episodes your first six episodes in the bag ready for distribution so whilst they're being distributed you're working on your next six episodes what it does is you can pay to have your work pushed out through their distribution channels and this is why they're a wholesaler so Anchor FM retails podcasts out to iTunes, Spotify, and other distribution channels. It's a good mechanism for getting content to audiences, but also getting content into points where it's discoverable by the key audience. Following on is our retail shop front, and this Spotify is has two roles to play in terms of uh, your ongoing projects first of all if you are a Spotify user it is the soundtrack of your life uh, you can so you pay for it or you have it interrupted by ads streaming and functionally it's a distribution retail outlet for audio if you want to sell on Spotify you've got to use a, a brokerage you've got to use a wholesaler uh, and we'll talk about tune call in just a moment but one of the other things you can do with Spotify is that the Spotify playlist has a certain social communication value. It can be used as a positioning strategy, as a communication tool. So you could put up, say you're running an Instagram account and you're out there being a lifestyle influencer, publishing your Spotify playlist as an influencer, as a, this is what I'm listening to. These are, yeah check out my Spotify playlist follow me on Spotify follow my trends follow my picks so it's worth thinking about its role as a promotional tool as a communications tool where the playlist is used as part of your positioning strategy for yourself as an influencer behind the scenes on Spotify is TuneCore now TuneCore is a wholesale outlet you pay them money and you pay them an annual license fee and they distribute your content through their network wholesaler to retailer they collect any royalties and they handle the legal arrangements so they are the optimum intermediary in theory the internet was designed to reduce intermediaries in practice the internet enables intermediaries because specialist professionals at distributing content remain specialist professionals who are needed but TuneCore if you are making music and that's part of your project this semester and you want to get it out onto the major platforms without signing with a major label TuneCore looks like your best option all right let's close out by talking about a theory in application 
Today's theory is a paper on social music sharing. There are three things about this paper that I want to address. First is it's got this really interesting idea of the extra musical sharing. Now, I mentioned Spotify playlists as a positioning strategy and as a communication strategy. This paper talks about the idea of music being transformed and co-opted from the original intent of the song into a different meaning. So co-creation of meaning through co-option, Rick Rowling through Rick Astley, Alexa, that's so sad. And you filled out the rest of the words for me, didn't you? All of these co-option events are functional co-creation events. So this paper talks about how they use the Reddit site to track down the different ways in which music was shared. There's a couple of different uh, sharing protocols in there. You might find that a useful way to think about how to do, make content for your project. So as an Instagrammer or lifestyle influencer or YouTube celebrity, being able to endorse and share music to say, hey, check out this tune, or this is what I'm listening to this week. And through the non -ex, the extra musical sharing, the creation of memes, the creation of alternate meanings. The other aspect of this paper I want to mention is one of the things about being a marketer is when you're reading papers that do market segmentation, occasionally you're there. You can see yourself reflected in the data. And I'd just like to shout out the fact that my Junkie XL listening habit has shown up precisely where I am on this chart of affluence and age. I'm paid well and I'm old and I listen to Junkie XL. Not least of which was their soundtrack for Fury Road, but also their soundtrack for the Nike campaign, Nike World Cup campaign with uh, Junkie XL's remix of Elvis Presley's A Little Less Conversation. You will find as you go on as a marketer, every now and then the data set hits a little close to home and you pick up a paper and it's like, just at me next time. So, if you need me, you've got the contact channels, throw open a uh, get a booking through Waddle, throw us an email, find us on the socials, however it works for you. If you need to get in touch, feel free, sing out, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the sequels.